Hey everybody, this is Cody Bateman. Welcome to a brand new version of our Relationship Marketing Podcast show. Uh, very excited for the guests that we have on today. Before we get to that, just uh, want to reach out to everybody that's been tuning in and uh, tell you how much I appreciate you being a student of this great concept called Relationship Marketing. Had some incredible guests on this call, uh, sales professionals, a lot of sales professionals been on this call, best-selling authors, speakers, trainers, teachers, um, and salespeople. You know, most of the people that we have on this show have been in the field of sales. They've been in the trenches. They've been top performers. Uh, also in the marketing arena, sales uh, specifically and marketing specifically. And, and we like to interview people that not only are great trainers, but have been in the trenches. Certainly have one of those on with us today. And uh, we're, we're, we're excited. So without further ado, just want to introduce uh, our guest today. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you, first of all, I'm going to show you this brand new book here. For those of, that are watching on YouTube, uh, you'll be able to see this. For those that are just listening, it's a bright orange book called Cells Differentiation by Lee Sauls. Lee, welcome to the show today. Cody, thank you so much for having me. And I know for our YouTubers who ever watch this, I, I like you've got the you got your books in the background and you've got the the sales differentiate and you got my book. Yeah. Right there, baby. <laughs> Power of Human Connection. He just he just put that up on the screen for the YouTubers to see. And and uh, it's just a delight. I I've heard so many great things about you. I'm gonna have the opportunity to speak on the same platform as you here at the end of April at the Outbound Conference. And you are one of the featured speakers at our upcoming Relationship Marketing Grand Summit. So we appreciate you coming to Salt Lake City to uh, share with us there. I'm super so, excited, Cody. Thank you. I'm, I'm really yeah. looking forward to being a part of that. Can I, can I ask you a question before we get yeah. started? Yeah, go right ahead. So you have your own podcast, so now you're just going to take over as the, <laughs> as the interview. Okay, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go here, ahead. Here's my question. I was listening to what you said, and it sounds like you've had a lot of expert guests on your show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? So so the listeners are probably wondering how Lee Sauls was selected to be on your show, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to tell them. Absolutely, go ahead. I'm the best sales consultant in the world. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's pretty rude. That's not funny. <laughs> no, I'm not that's trying to be funny. Like, oh, I just buddy, you know, what do you, what do you I, think I, of I like your now? boldness. What do, you, what do you think of me now, based on that introduction? I'm the best sales consultant in the world. Well, honestly, I mean, I, I, I don't think you need to be the one to tell people that. I think other oh. people ought to tell people that. Exactly. And so, in other words, I probably turned you off, turned the other folks off. Now, before you go running away for the show, here, here's my big question. If you think this about me, these negative thoughts, why do you think buyers think any differently about you when you come marching in saying, my company, my products, my services are the best? They don't, they feel the same way about you that you feel about me at this moment, right? Because we come in preaching that we're the best and we think that we're endearing ourselves to others and we're actually turning people off just like I did with you. You know, what's, here's what's funny about that. First of all, there's no question about it. And when you, when you posture it that way, people that are listening immediately see that. They're immediately like, well, yeah, duh, duh. Like, that was, like why, would you, why would you be so bold as to do that? It is a turnoff. But then they don't relate it to what they're doing. It, That's exactly it, right. It happens all the time. Like, my subject is relationship marketing course, and we have a company called Send Out Cards that uh, you use to follow up with people. So we talk a lot about proper ways to follow up, a proper way to say thank you to somebody. Yeah. And it blows my mind because most people in sales and marketing get this idea that when they are in the sales seat and they want to reach out to a prospect, whether it's a thank you for meeting with me or whatever, they go into this weird sales mode where it's like, hey, thank you. And oh, by the way, would you fill out this survey? And hey, you know, we're super cool. Here's all our neat features. And by the way, if you know somebody, could you refer them to us? Well, <laughs> you were just supposed to say thank you. Exactly. But, yeah, you, you. So it's the same thing. You know what I mean? It's the same yeah. thing. So I tell people all the time to do the litmus test. All you got to do is say, how, 
when, when somebody follows up with you and you receive a, a, a letter or a greeting card or whatever, or a text or an inbox or whatever in, in, in the mail or whatever as a follow up, how do you want to be treated? Like, how do you want to be treated? Do you, do you want to get a survey after the first visit? Of course do you not. Want, do you want someone to try to throw up on you with all their offerings and, you know, act now or lose out kind of crap? Do you want, because you don't want that. You never want that. So why do you do it? So it's the same thing what you did, we're just doing. Yeah. And so you mentioned that survey. Um, and uh, there's a video series I have called the Sales Differentiation Minute. And, I, and the one that hit the streets today talks about these surveys. We call them customer satisfaction surveys. So we send out these surveys looking to see if we got a C on our report card, right? That's what satisfaction is. I've met your minimum basic expectations. Right. How about we send out a client delight survey and make sure that we've exceeded expectations? And, and so the theme of my book, and that actually is not in my book, Sales Differentiation, is actually a second version that's in the works and I talk about that there but the whole idea is that every interaction we have between a seller and a buyer gives us opportunities to be different to provide meaningful value that our competitors are not and so those surveys for example you get this and it says okay did I meet minimum basic expectations well that's exciting and then you fill it out and you know nobody reads it because we've all had the horrible experience and we've gone on the survey and we gave them all zeros or wrote in negative comments, never heard from a single person, did you? But if you took those client delight surveys and then use that data to improve your organization, now it becomes a story that you can tell when you're selling. That as part of the relationship with us on an annual basis, we're gonna send you a survey. And it's not a customer satisfaction survey, it's a client delight survey. We want to make sure that we exceed your expectations, that we earn your business every single day. And when you fill that out, we're going to look at it. We're not just going to look at the data and say, gee, that's a nice statistic. Our best ideas come from our clients. And if you're doing this over a period of time, your best ideas will come from your clients. And you're going to be able to go back and enhance the service experience, maybe even adjust the product based on the feedback that you get. You so know, let me ask you, yeah. let's talk about surveys for a second. You know, we weren't planning to talk surveys today, but you brought it up, so let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony, we can go any which way you want. So when, when is the best time to send a survey? Like when's the best time to do that in, in the sales process or even in a customer process. So there's a sales process that closes a sale and then you have a customer that might be an ongoing customer that right. repurchases from you through the sales cycle and the customer cycle. When's the best time to send surveys? Well, it depends what kind of survey you're, you're referring to. I, I always like the survey, particularly when there's a transition process or an implementation or an onboarding where a client was either uh, using a different supplier or they're outsourcing for the first time and you have a process to assimilate them from the current circumstance to the new one. So I always like to have a survey and see how well we performed in taking them from where they were to where they are now. Always looking for opportunities to improve that experience because if you look at one of the biggest reasons why sales don't get done it's not price it's fear fear of change and that transition process another opportunity to be different is to have a transition process that helps me as a buyer feel comfortable and confident that I'm going to have an outstanding experience yeah and I think yeah that's super good stuff and kind of what I'm looking for is we talk a lot here about creating ongoing genuine authentic relationship with people and I have a book titled The Power of Human Connection and it's creating genuine human connection with people there you go you could lift it again <laughs> creating genuine human connection with people through your business uh, through your business um, uh, through the whole process of running your business mm -hmm. and it, it's really important and so you know surveys are great and, and things to help you are great but it's so important to create relationship before you do that you know and of course the better your relationship is 
Uh, the more authentic the survey responses are going to be, probably the better response you're going to get. And maybe, you know, people would be more into it. But it's always important to create relationship as you go before you start asking a customer for things in return. Those are some of kind of the things we talk about. Now, I got to back up just for a second. Yeah. We, we, we kind of jumped right in with you being rude about who, how great you are. <laughs> <laughs> Teaching our listeners what not to do, which is great. So, but I want to talk a little bit. People need to know who you are. Um, leading sales management strategist. He's the CEO of Sales Architects. He's a recognized expert in sales differentiation. He works with senior executives and business owners across all industries, helping their salespeople win more deals at the prices they want. Frequent sought after keynote speaker and consultant on sales differentiation. And the list goes on and on. Feature columnist in the business journals and a media source on sales and sales management. He's been quoted and featured in the Wall Street Journal, CNN, the New York Times, MSNBC, ABC News, and numerous other outlets. In addition to sales architects, Lee created the Revenue Accelerator, which is super cool, a sales onboarding and enablement technology firm that structures and automates the onboarding experience for salespeople. So this, uh, I just want to make sure our listeners know this is a been there, done that, doing that kind of guy and uh, lots of accolades out there, a strong resume. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just an honor, sir, to have you with us. It really is. It's, it's great to have you. Now, I want to, I want to well, jump First right of all, the, the honor is mine. I, I really appreciate being on the show. Uh, absolutely. And we're excited. I, like I said, I'm going to be speaking with you at the uh, Outbound Conference in Atlanta, and then you'll be at our event, the Relationship Marketing Grand Summit, on August 9th. So if you all don't know about the Relationship Marketing Grand Summit, go to uh, the RelationshipMarketingSummit.com, and you can um, get all the information you need to go and attend that. Uh, it's action-packed, tons of speakers on the subject of relationship marketing, how to transform your business by creating genuine relationships. So uh, you're going to want to get to that. All right, well, let's jump in. I, I love the name of this latest book of yours, the orange book. I call it the orange book. I'm going to put, lift it up here again. Uh, those on YouTube are seeing me uh, hold this up, sales differentiation. You also see behind Lee on his bookshelf, you see it just, it, it's perfectly, just so you know, it is perfectly positioned Right over your right ear. I mean, it's perfect. Like, is that that must be planned? And then you got no, your actually, trophy. It's not. It's funny that that it works out that way because there's plenty of books up there, and it just happens to work out that my seat <laughs> is in this particular spot right now. Well, and then right above it, you got all your weight. And so Lee's a weightlifter. He's been a champion weightlifter, and so right above it, you got your weightlifting trophies. I see. Yeah, you got stuff positioned perfectly. It's really good. <laughs> Okay, so sales differentiation. For the, the name itself is huge. Uh, what, 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 is, what is it? Like you've got 19 strategies to win more deals at the prices you want, but your main focus is on differentiation. Talk to us about that word. What, what's the significance of differentiation in, in sales? Sure. So sales differentiation is a philosophy that I've developed over 30 years, and I like to say, and this is politically incorrect, that I got pregnant with the idea as a teenager. I got hired, a family friend had this unique idea, which at the time was unique, um, this idea of a dry cleaner that you didn't have to go there, that someone would come to your home and pick up your, your laundry and then bring it back clean. And so I'm going way back because I'm 50 now, and I was a 17-year-old at the time, and what he did was he went and uh, developed relationships with some dry cleaners that didn't have vans because nobody was doing it back then. And he said, I'm going to pick up the laundry and I'm going to bring it back to you. So he developed these relationships and turned it into a business, which was different. So he was charging a premium for this service. And I was his driver. So I was the one driving around picking up all the laundry and, and bringing it back clean and uh, and I was intrigued by this whole different way that he had gone about developing his business. So that's what one of the first inspirations was for it. But it took me until very recently to have crystallized this in such a way that I was ready to share it with the world. 
Uh, and so I say I got pregnant with the idea as a teenager, but it wasn't ready to pop out and to show you everybody um, until just very recently. See, because it doesn't matter what, what you're selling. There's always going to be a conversation about price because the buyer is trying to justify the price that you put in front of them. And so they, they're looking at every aspect, both of the, the product and the way that they're being sold and saying, is there enough value here to justify the price that's just been put in front of me? So when, when in sales differentiation, I break it into two parts, and the book actually walks you through these two halves. The first is sales differentiation in what you sell. It's understanding what your differentiators are, when they're relevant, to whom they're relevant, how to get someone excited about them. So often I find salespeople and, and executive teams so passionate about the differentiators that they possess, but they're completely ineffective in getting someone on the other side of the desk as excited as they are about those differentiators. And Cody, here's the deal, and I'm sure you already know this. If you can't get someone as excited as you are about your differentiators, you may as well not have them because there's only one conversation you're going to have, which is price. And I'll give you an example. I'll tell you a story. I, I live in, in Minnesota, Minneapolis, and we're coming off another one of our brutal winters. We have a brutal winter every year, but this one was even, even tougher. And I have two large dogs, they're about 70 pounds, that I adopted from a shelter. And from the end of November to the end of March, give or take, I let them go in the backyard and do their business and I don't pick it up. Now, before you say that's disgusting, remember where I live, <laughs> right? We had so much snow. I have a fence in my yard about five feet tall. We had so much snow and I had a snow drift that one of my dogs was able to walk right up the snow drift and out of my yard. Okay? So... As you might imagine, you get to the end of March and the dog's been doing their business all this time. There's a lot of dog poop back there, and I have no interest in picking this up. So I found a company that every year they would do what's called a spring cleanup, and they'd pick up all the dog poop. But there was always one thing about the service that I didn't like. They picked it all up, and they'd leave giant bags of dog poop on the side of my house, and it was left for me to discard. So I had to pick these up. I put it in my garbage cans. Now it starts to thaw, and you can imagine what my garage smells like. Right. So last year, I called to schedule service, just as I had done for many years, and they didn't respond. And I received an email from one of their competitors. Who would have thought this is a competitive business? Offering to provide that service for the same price. And I said, okay, this isn't rocket science. We could use somebody new. So I contracted with them. And their guy comes out, he picks up all the dog poop, and he's leaving. I said, what are you doing? He says, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm done. I said, yes, but, but you're taking the dog poop with you. He says, well, yeah, that's what we do. I said, oh, my gosh, you take the poop with you? And he's like, yeah, that, that's what our company does. Cody, it made my week knowing that I didn't have to deal with this. So then that afternoon, I get a call from the owner of the small business saying, you know, how'd we do? I said, oh, you did fine. I said, do you compete with this other company? He says, yeah, we run into them quite a bit, as a matter of fact. I said, do you know what your number one differentiator, your biggest differentiator is compared to them? He says, no, I can't think of anything. I said, you take the poop. Yeah. And he says, oh, yeah, I think I knew that. And I said, You've got to be talking about that when you're selling your service. Ask a question like this. What are your expectations with respect to discarding the waste once we pick it up? Most people are going to expect industry standard. Now it's an industry. Um, industry standard would be to take it with you. But you know at least one of your competitors does not. So this is an opportunity for you to differentiate yourself. Now, when I first started telling you this story, I said the email had the same price that I had been paying. I would have paid more for that yeah, service. Exactly, yeah. But I didn't tell him that. I didn't need a price increase. Right. But I would have paid more. He had meaningful differentiators, and he wasn't positioned, wasn't talking about them. And I see that in sales all the time, where salespeople, they get so frustrated that every deal comes down to a price war. 
But when you talk with them about their strategies for differentiating themselves, it's like, um, yeah, I really didn't do any of that. Well, of course, you gave them one, one piece of criteria to make a decision on, which was price. Yeah, I tell you, this, this is, that's a powerful story, by the way. It's really good. I, I see right now the slogan, we take the poop with us. You know, we, <laughs> <laughs> we take the poop with us. But it's so true. I mean, a lot of people don't really realize what is their differentiator. Now, I'm going to ask you, because as I hear you explain differentiator, I immediately, you know, my background's marketing. Um, I have a degree in marketing. And we learned very early on in marketing that there's this thing called USP, unique selling proposition. Yes. So I see similarity, a lot of similarity between differentiator and unique selling proposition. Are they the same thing? Are they different? Talk to us about that. Yeah. So, um, so first thing is that I mentioned that there was one, that the one side of sales differentiation. The other side of it is sales differentiation in how you sell. Every interaction between a salesperson and a buyer provides them with opportunities to be different, to provide meaningful value that the competition does not. So you have sales differentiation strategy in what you sell and in how you sell. So now let's come back to your question. I absolutely despise the word unique. Okay. And the reason is this, when a salesperson is looking for something that's unique, they're looking for something that's a needle in the haystack. Very, very few companies have something that meets the definition of unique, where it's the only one that exists anywhere. And if you look up the word unique and the word difference in Webster's, you'll find they're not synonyms. Unique is, it's the only one. That's what a patent is, and most of us aren't lucky enough to be selling something that's patented. But different is relative to something else, relative to alternatives. And what I work with organizations to do is to understand their fingerprint, if you will. Every company is different. And when you look at every aspect that they have in that organization, in both what they sell and how they sell, they have opportunities to communicate a message that their competition does not. And, that's, and, that's, and the other part of what um, you alluded to, you mentioned the marketing when I first talk about differentiation with executives, their minds always go to that same place, marketing. But they're not wrong. They're just limited in their belief. See, I believe there's marketing differentiation and there's sales differentiation. And they're related, but they're also different. Marketing differentiation is one directional communication for the masses. It screams, hey, look at us. We're here. That's what a website does. That's what a trade show booth does. That's what marketing materials does. It speaks to all the potential of what could be. But sales differentiation takes that potential, all of this that's out there, capabilities, and narrows it down to a specific solution for you. Everyone buys for a different reason, every single person. And so if we don't take those capabilities and have two directional communication, which is what sales differentiation is about, two directional communication with an individual specific buyer so that we take all these capabilities and narrow it down to the right solution for you. So we use that word solution very loosely. We say we sell solutions. You can't sell solutions. A solution is a function of understanding what someone's needs, wants, desires, objectives are, and the capabilities you bring to bear and pulling all that together to figure out what that solution is. So, so what I'm hearing is marketing is more of, here's who we are, here's what we do, here's how we're different. Sales is more, let me find out what your needs are, let me assess what your needs are, and see if there's a way that I can take what we have to help you. Is, it, is that a good summary of what you just said? <laughs> sort of. So with, with marketing differentiation is more big picture potential. It's building brand awareness. But sales differentiation is making the whole experience personal. Right. So it's, it's taking all of these capabilities, slicing the ones that are completely irrelevant out, slicing those out, figure out the ones that are relevant based on your needs, wants, desires, and objectives. Yeah, so again, assessment. The word assessment comes up a lot in these shows. Uh, most people talk about today's day and age. 
And keep in mind, this, is, this, this, this podcast is about relationship marketing. It's about creating relationships as you go. Mm-hmm. And that's why I really resonate with the word assessment in the sales process. So when I hear you say what you just said about sales differentiation, there really is a lot to that. I mean, the difference between marketing and sales is sales is, is you make it about the person you're selling to, not about you. You make it about what their needs are. There's always a need for an assessment in order for you to figure out what those needs are. And if you're a good assessor, if you're, if you're good at assessing, that's a great relationship building quality. So that seems to come up all the time in the, in the sales process. So let's, let's jump a little bit. Let's talk about uh, relationship marketing in general. You know, you, you um, obviously you have all these different differentiators. And of course, in my book, Power of Human Connection, I talk a lot about the importance of, of genuine relationship through the process. What's the difference between genuine relationship and relationship just to create a sale? Well, I'd be a billionaire if I could teach genuine. You either you are or you're not. And I talk about that in one of the chapters of personal value differentiation. And it can't be taught right? You, you genuinely care. You don't I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I built a sales team during the dot-com boom in a technology training company. And so I had a sales team that sold to the federal government that sold to companies and sold to career changers. And these were people on the outside looking into technology and saying, boy, I got to get one of these jobs in, in it. And I could stack rank my salespeople the career changer salespeople based on the use of one item. Cody, you want to guess what that was? What's that? Boxes of tissues. <laughs> My top salespeople went through boxes and boxes and boxes of tissues because these career changers, they were coming to us. They wanted to get married. They wanted to start a family. They wanted to buy a home. Some were deeply in debt. Some wanted to buy a car. Very emotional conversations. My bottom salespeople, the tissues that were in their office when they arrived is the same box that was there when they left. Wow. Wow. That's it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I was always amazed at holiday time, the FedEx guy, the UPS guy, the postman coming into our offices, not to pick up, to drop off gifts. These students who these salespeople helped go through these programs because they were tough programs, stuck with them helped them get that new job. They endeared themselves so much that holiday time, they bought their salespeople gifts. Mm. You don't hear that very often, do you? No, no you don't. So that's what I'm talking when you When you use that word genuine, that's, that's the story that immediately comes to mind. And when these career changers would get that first job or they'd get promoted, their first phone call was not to their significant other. It was back to their salesperson say, hey, I just want to let you know I just got a job making $10,000 more. Thank you so much for helping me to get through the program. Wow. Wow. Powerful stuff. You got great stories. I love your stories. Uh, great stuff. Anybody that talks about poop on my show, that's, that's pretty good. So, <laughs> 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 All right. So uh, this fall, you're, or, uh, well, actually, end of the summer, August 9th, you're going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah speaking at the Relationship Marketing Grand Summit. Why should somebody attend an event like that? Uh, also, you're going to be at the Outbound Conference. Yeah. Why should people go to these things? Why should they go to Outbound? Why should they go to the Grand Summit? What's so important about making that kind of an investment? I mean, they can listen to this podcast and learn anything. I can read this book and learn everything. Why go to these events? What, what's the difference there? Because top salespeople are insatiable when it comes to learning. They never stop. I have a client, their top salesperson makes over a half a million dollars a year. And when my sales differentiation minute video comes out each week, he is always the first one to watch it. Comes out at 7 a.m. Central, and I look and see who opened, who watched. He is always the first one. He's the envy of his team, yet he is the one that's looking for strategies, looking for ways to do something different to continue to elevate his game. You know, we, we use this uh, contrast with athletes very often. We say salespeople are just like professional athletes, and they're not. 
it's a, it's a poor contrast. Here's why. <laughs> Athletes will work countless hours, countless hours, so that when the game is on, the competition is on, when you can't think, you can only do, you execute flawlessly. Because they know in that moment, you come up with the bases loaded, it's opening day for baseball today, you're coming up with the bases loaded with two outs in the bottom of the ninth, the game's on the line, that you execute. Salespeople, most of them, they play the game over and over and over again, hoping to get better. They don't work enough uh, outside of the game to improve their knowledge, to improve their skills, so that every time they're in the game, they execute flawlessly. Okay, so I love, I love that analogy or metaphor or whatever you want to call it. I, lo I love that because I talk a lot in my speeches about fundamentals, learning fundamentals of your craft. So in sales, there's fundamentals. Uh, and, and different industry cells have different kinds of fundamentals. You, and you gotta, you got to know what the fundamentals are and you got to practice them. Mm -hmm. So like you say, one, going to events is an opportunity. It's, you're going to practice. You're going to practice. You're going there to learn. A lot of times there's interactive workshops that go on. There's role playing that takes place. There's chances for you to practice the fundamentals before you go in the game. When you get back home and you get on the phone, you're back in the game again. I mean, you're back yeah. in front of people again. And so I love the way you, you share that because I think it's real important. So while we're on the subject of fundamentals, what are some basic fundamentals in your mind in order to create relationship, genuine relationship, and make sure the differentiators that you offer are in place? What are some basic fundamentals that people should do every day to make those two things happen? So I'll give you one. There, there are two words that we all use in our society and salespeople probably more than anyone else. They use these two words and they don't think for one moment how they're gonna be received by the person that's hearing them. And they're two words that I personally guarantee turn buyers off. You wanna guess the two words, Cody? Uh, I, I don't wanna guess, I want you to tell me. <laughs> well, you just said them. I want. I want. There you go. I want. Right? So go. if you're lucky enough to get a meeting with someone and you start this meeting with, well, here's what I want to do today, Cody. Yeah. I want to ask you some questions. I want to learn about your business. I want to show you our stuff. So we're back to the very beginning of our conversation today. I started off by saying I'm the best sales consultant in the world and I turned you off. Now I'm saying I want, so this whole meeting is about me, what I want to do today. Well, it's our meeting. It's the two of us. So what if we started that meeting in a different fashion? What if we asked a question? For this to be a good use of your time, what is it you want to be sure we cover today, Cody? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Right, right at that first, the beginning part of the meeting, we've set the tone for, hey, this is going to be a conversation back and forth. It's not just about me. I'm not here to peddle my wares, trying to just get commission dollars off of you. It's going to be conversational, and the goal is for this to benefit, be beneficial for both parties. All right, so let's role play right now. Let's go back. I want. Uh, let's go back. We're sitting down. I'm the prospect. You're the sales person. Mm -hmm. You walk in, and you start with that you start with that question. Go, go ahead and do that, and I'm going to respond. I'm going to see how you respond to it. I can actually, before I get there, I would start uh, someplace else. Okay. Cody, I'm not here to tell you that what I have to offer is the best. What I will do today is share with you some differences that our clients find meaningful, and you can decide for yourself if those are meaningful to you as well. Okay. Okay. What I've just communicated there is, hey, let's put down – our swords. I'm not going to insult you. I'm not going to come in and tell you that I'm the best or what I have to offer is the best. And so that I, I don't want that buyer eye roll. You're familiar with that, Cody? Yeah. The buyer yeah. eye roll? Every time we hear that word best, oh, here we go. And so we lay down our swords. Let's figure out if there's something to be done here. So with that said, then I would move into for this to be a good use of your time, Cody, what is it that you want us to be sure to cover today? 
So I want to, I want you to cut to the chase. I don't have much time. I, sure. I need you to cut to the chase. Uh, don't you want to know how much it is, Cody, don't you? What's that? You want to know how much it is. Oh, well, I want to know what you're going to provide. And sure, price is always a, a factor, yeah. But right. I, I, I want to know why, why should I do business with you versus the 10 others that I just Googled last week? Because mm. I've got information on you and your competition already. Yeah. Um, so just cut to the chase, man. Get to the Absolutely. chase. Uh, let's, what, what, is it we're, what, what, what is it that you have to offer? Yeah, and if you're a salesperson in that situation, you better be ready to say, you know what, I'll bet you as you did your research, all of our companies look pretty much the same. And so all roads then lead to who's going to be the cheapest for, for this product. Let me share with you three differences that our clients find meaningful. And I'll, and I'll give you some context as to why they find them meaningful that you may not have seen as you did your research. A, B, and C. Okay. Okay, good. But you got to, if you haven't done that prep ahead of time, you can't possibly be able to do that while you're together. Well, and here's one thing that I, I want to kind of bring up. We've talked about it on other episodes of this before, and I know you talk about this in your books. The better you have gotten at creating dialogue prior to this sit down, the, the less uh, conflict you'll have or the, the less awkwardness you'll have. I just created some awkwardness. Dude, cut to the chase, would you? Come on. Yeah. I'm a busy guy. I already know about your stuff. What is it you want to do? You want to minimize the possibility of that happening. And so if, if you're creating relationship through the sales process, the more, the more relationship you've created, the less likely I'm going to treat you that way mm -hmm. when, I, when I sit down with you. I mean, we've all been in the buying chair. All of us have sat in the buying chair. We're, yeah. we're all busy especially yep. in business to business sales, we're all extremely busy. The business sales guy comes in and you're the buyer. We've all been the buyer. So it's kind of the same thing as how you started the show. You know, how just put yourself in the buyer's seat. That's all you got to do. Just, if you're a salesperson, put yourself in the buyer's seat because we've all been in the buyer's seat. Exactly. And, uh, how does, how do you want to be, how do you want to be treated as a buyer? So if I've got someone sitting down with me that's already put an investment in, in my relationship, that cares about me, truly cares about my, uh, you, you know, what my needs are, mm -hmm. then chances are there's going to be a much better dialogue. So it's important to create that relationship as you go. Now, how do you do that? So let's go back to okay, your prospecting. And I know you've got some chapters on prospecting. You know, you're, in fact, you talk specifically about differentiation through the prospecting process. How do you create this kind of dialogue in the prospecting before that sit down meeting? Yeah. And so um, just to backtrack a little bit, I went to college in upstate New York, Binghamton University, and I was a history major. And while I studied history, I learned some very interesting business facts. And one of the facts that I learned is that in the history of business, there's never been an executive whose sole responsibility has been to meet with salespeople. It's never happened. <clears throat> We're an interruption. We're an interruption to their day. And so when we talk about the prospecting that we're going to do, so there's no one there saying, boy, my job is to meet with salespeople. And, and so I've got to meet one every hour on the hour. And I can't wait for those calls to come in. So we are, we are an interruption. We, right. we have to be very, very creative in that prospecting approach. And, and I find salespeople don't know who their biggest competitor is. I love asking this question. I'll ask, who's your biggest competitor? And they'll rattle off company A, company B, company C. And I'll say, boy, those are tough competitors, but there's one even tougher. And someone will say, oh, that old sales trainer one, the status quo, the choice to do nothing, which is also formidable. There's one even tougher that I've never had anyone guess. Do you happen to know who that is? Who's that? Every salesperson calling the same person you are trying to get a meeting. Right. See, we're, we're egocentric when we think about competition. We think about just the players in our space. But you're calling an, an executive, a CFO, a president, a business owner, and they have this broad purview of responsibility. They're receiving calls from salespeople representing all of that 
and more. All of them wanting one thing, FaceTime. And I don't mean the Apple technology. I mean having an in-person meeting. Right. And since nobody has uh, this job of meet with salespeople every hour on the hour, they're only going to meet with a select few salespeople, ones that are able to create intrigue in that initial outreach. So in the book, I teach this strategy. I call it a sales crime theory to help you develop a different approach to prospecting. Would you like me to share it with you? Sure, yeah. Okay. It's two in the morning, and there's a pounding on your front door. It's the police. They want to have a conversation with you about a crime that's recently been committed. Now, they don't randomly pick you and your home for this conversation. They follow a trail of evidence, put together a crime theory, and that's led them to you for a conversation right now. Can you see where we're going? Mm -hmm. A sales crime theory. The idea is that we want to seek the answer to this question. Why should they want to have a conversation with us right now? Not why should we talk with them. Why should they want to have a conversation with us right now? So we need to figure out what types of evidence that if we came across it would say, ah, they would want to have a conversation with us right now. So I have a, a coaching client that sells technology for conference rooms. And they went through an exercise like this with me and they said, okay, well, if there's a new CIO or there's an acquisition or a relocation, those are all examples of times where there's a conversation going on inside their company about technology and conference rooms. And since that's what I provide, they should want to have a conversation with me right now. So when you know the types of evidence that you seek, you then go and look for it. You, in their case, they're looking for a relocation, acquisition, a new CIO getting hired. And they use that information to create a different approach when they're prospecting. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Now I want to, so <laughs> as, as I've listened to you kind of go through that whole concept, I kept thinking about, you know, uh, today's day and age, there's all kinds of technology that we use in the prospecting process, mm -hmm. in the sales process, in the whole sales process. And we have these CRMs today. Oh yeah. And I'm sure that you have counts, consulted a lot of companies on how to use a CRM or functionality of a CRM. One thing I've noticed in the buyer chair about, I always know when I'm being prospected by someone that's in their CRM. I, I can always tell, like I can totally tell, okay, I'm, I'm in their system. I'm in their email drip right now mm -hmm. and they're dripping emails on me yeah. and I know. And anybody in sales knows when they're in the buyer chair, you know, when you're in someone's CRM drip, that's what I call it. A CRM yeah. drip. Yep. Where there's, there's the email that goes out. Hey, Cody, uh, you know, our sales guy is going to be in town next week. And uh, we've set aside 30 minutes of his time <laughs> just to be with you. And uh, would two o'clock Thursday or four o'clock Thursday work best for you? Right. Look forward to hearing back so that we can collaborate together. Right. Yeah. Why do I want to hear from them? Just like going back to your question, why do I want to hear from them? Right. So oh. let me give you let me give you a scenario. Okay. Let's pretend we sell technology that helps to reduce costs and improve efficiency in manufacturing. And we see this article in the business journal. And it's an interview with the CEO of ABC Manufacturing talking about an initiative for the upcoming year to reduce costs and improve efficiency. We now have the sales crime theory evidence to reach out to a head of manufacturing because that's who those responsibilities are going to be passed along to. So I'll give you two scenarios. Salesperson number one calls that head of manufacturing and says, hey, I, I see you're the head of manufacturing. I'm guessing you're trying to reduce costs and improve efficiency. Well, that's something that our company uh, works with folks like you to do. Salesperson number two calls up and says, I was just reading an interview with your CEO where he talked about an initiative for the upcoming year to reduce costs and improve efficiency. 
And given that you're the head of manufacturing, I'm guessing those responsibilities are being passed along to you. And that's something we work with manufacturing leaders to address. Which of those two salespeople is more likely to get the meeting? Well, the second one for sure. Okay, so here's the big question. Which one had the better product? Yeah. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. It was all about differentiating how you sell. Yeah, that's good. That's really, really good. <laughs> yeah, again, it's it's just amazing to me. You know, you, you just put yourself in the buyer's seat. That's all you got to do is put yourself there and say, you know, what kind of um, what kind of activities is gonna is gonna help you out, stuff like that. One of the things that, and I'm going back to my scenario of what I call the CRM drip. Yeah, uh, the CRM drip. It's interesting because everybody seems to be doing it. And the interesting thing about it is, is that the first thing I think of, this is the first thing I think of when I know I'm in someone's CRM drip is the first thing I think of is I'm not going to respond to this person. If, 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 if uh, I'm going to respond to somebody that I already know, or I'm going to respond to somebody that knows somebody that does this, that can, that, that I can get a reference from, because I don't know this person, so I don't waste my time with that. Yeah. So what does that say? And I know there's a lot of people in the buying in the buying chair has to relate with that. I can't be the only person that thinks that way. So so the point is the point is how important is it again to create relationship with people to where they're referring you to people that might want your product and service? Because yeah. I'm going to take the appointment from someone that. I got referred by or referred to. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I don't know. So that, that's no, you're, the whole you're, relationship process got to be part of it. You're exactly right. And, and so here's the thing with prospecting. It's not just creating intrigue. You also have to have the right timing, right? If there isn't a particular project that you would be involved in, even though you reached the person, you got a great story and you differentiate yourself, there's just nothing there. And there's a concept that I teach called a network neighborhood. See, the drip campaigns you talk about is a salesperson with their hand out saying, hey, you got business for me, you got business for me, you got business for me. And of course, that's rather grating. The idea with a network neighborhood is for a salesperson to develop an email campaign for their prospects and clients at a schedule that they can maintain. If it's once a week, if it's twice a month, once a month, whatever it is. And they're going to send an email with a piece of information in it that would help their prospects and clients in their role. My hand is not out. Hey, I just came across a new study or a new article or a new product about this. I thought you'd find it interesting. My objective there is to provide guidance to them that would help them in their role so that when the timing is right, I'm the first one that they think of. There's no solicitation in that. My signature is there with my phone number and my email address. But I'm not trying to sell them anything. I'm trying to demonstrate expertise, provide value to them, even though not a nickel is changing hands. And that yeah. works extremely well. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, you know, and there's so many ways today to do that. There's so many ways to create relationship as you're going without your handout. I mean, you're there, you, 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 have a, you show that you have a genuine interest in the human being, not the, not the person with the checkbook. And, you know, in, in, in our relationship marketing system, we talk a lot about that. You know, that you got social media today. You can see what people are doing on social media. Celebrate them, you know, comment on their stuff, celebrate their stuff. We tell them to send them greeting cards in the mail. I mean, just send them a card, congratulate them for something. I mean, most people use LinkedIn today, so you can go to LinkedIn. In fact, most of the salespeople listening, you utilize LinkedIn to find out who to sell to. So through LinkedIn profiles, you can learn about people and you can get to their Facebook pages and learn about them and gain an interest in them as a human being, not the person with the checkbook. And whether you like it or not, folks, that's the world we live in today. You have, you have to differentiate yourself that way. Otherwise, you're going to get left in the dust because, you know, the old, the old traditional sales approaches just don't really work today. Yeah. So... Well, listen, Lee, we could go on all day. You're, it's fascinating to talk to you, and we could go on all day long. I always like to close each of our sessions by giving you the floor. Uh, give you the floor. You know, we've, we've gone through, we've asked some questions. Of course, you took the floor at the very beginning. You just 
but but we're gonna end that way. We're gonna end with yeah. you. Just, so this is this is your time to just you know what what is what is it that our listeners need to hear right now, as far as differentiating themselves in the marketplace uh, in their sales efforts. Go ahead. Okay, so the the first thing is if you're intrigued by what we were talking about here today. My book, Sales Differentiation, is available on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, your favorite bookstore, and it's available, there it is, in, uh, in hardcover, Kindle, and audiobook. And wherever it is you buy it, visit salesdifferentiation.com and sign up for my Sales Differentiation Minute video series. If you bought the book, you get the series for free, and it helps you put into practice what you read about. So that's one thing that, that I think is really important uh, as part of having the text to have some content to help put it into practice. But the, the biggest message that I hope you, you take away from what we've talked about here today is how you sell, not just what you sell, differentiates you. And Cody and I have been talking back and forth about so many different ways that you can do that. I mean, pretend you're a real estate agent. You can't affect the houses that you're selling. The only way that you can provide value is the way in which you sell. Excuse me. It's the way in which you sell. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Well, there you have it, my friends. Lee Sauls, um, best-selling author, brand newest book, Sales Differentiation. Make sure you get on Amazon or wherever to pick that up. I look forward to being with you at the Outbound Conference at the end of this month in Atlanta. And uh, y'all come on out to Salt Lake City, August 9th. Go to uh, relationshipmarketinggrandsummit.com. Find out the information about that event. Boy, we're going to have some incredible speakers there. And learning all about this concept called relationship marketing. And uh, so we just, we appreciate you being on. Look forward to seeing you here in a couple weeks and uh, take care everybody. We'll see you next time. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Relationship Marketing Podcast with Cody B, be sure to subscribe to the show and leave a review so that together we can get this message, The Power of Human Connection, out to the world. You can find Cody's new book, The Power of Human Connection on Amazon or the Send Out Cards gift store.